can you pick up on that um, in, in reference maybe to the panel's report or in something that Bertram or Karen have said? Well, I think, I think there, there are just so much information in, in what they both said. The, the main takeaways I have from Bertram's comments were multiple representations are important. That whether it's, whether it's that overdone metaphoric pizza piece, and, and, and there are ways, to, by the way, to make that make sense. And I agree with Wu a lot. In fact, in my classes, I usually tell my students, you, you can use any example you want other than a pizza, because I think, think pizza pie is overused in our culture. I'm half Italian. I'm allowed to say that. Um, <laughs> But I also think uh, thinking about fractions as part of a region other than circular regions, whether it's a rectangular region or, or an area model makes sense, moving to a number line so that children have this experience of thinking about fractions in different ways. Relative to what uh, Karen just said with regard to professional development, I, I, I think you'll find that there are pockets of schools maybe that feel better than other schools and so forth. So the opportunity that a large district like Montgomery County, Maryland has in job embedded professional development to deliver the goods, if you will, for people who have needs is tremendous. Mm -hmm. And I suspect your viewers, who, many of whom are in very rural districts or spread out around this country in urban, rural, suburban pockets, may not have have the access to, to the kind of professional development that is that is absolutely critical. I, I think this is a missing piece, frankly, mm -hmm. in, in, in our work, in particularly working with teachers at the elementary, moving on into the middle grade levels. And by the way, I should say that our discussion here tends to be at the, about the elementary school teacher. Mm -hmm. Middle school teachers, are, you know, they live here. They live with rational numbers uh, big time and have historically for a long time. So they're very much a part of this conversation. Okay, great, great. Uh, say, I, I, I throw this out to the panel about this idea of elementary, middle, and high, and the sort of the PD that goes on. Because Skip's right, we've been focusing mostly on elementary school teachers, but how does that then flow up through those other grade levels and, and work? Are the same people, say, Karen, are they working at elementary and also middle, let's say, to bridge the PD that goes on in those two. Um, can you speak a little bit to that too? The professional development that needs to occur and occurs much less in a district that is as large as ours where you have to have a vertical articulation I think sometimes can happen better in a smaller district because you can get everyone together in one place and have the kind of conversations that are needed about what's happening in elementary school and how that builds to what's happening in middle school and then to high school so that the elementary school teachers see what the end result should be, what's expected, and the high school teachers get a sense of what really has been developed, what students know and should be able to do when they get to high school. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Karen. Bertrand, let me, let me throw the last question to you. How does that embedded PD work out at a building level? Well, in, in a large system like Montgomery County, where we have, it's very difficult to get teachers together. Having a, a local staff development teacher, having a math content coach, having a specialist in a building can actually provide a, a lot of support to, to teachers. And that's, that's the embedded uh, staff development that, that is very invaluable because that person can be a model to, to classroom. Teachers can provide um, peer and reflection visits, can come in and observe and, and provide the support that a teacher needs on an ongoing basis mm -hmm. to improve their, their mathematics um, instruction. Great. Thanks, Bertram. This seems a good time to get our audience involved. And I've just been handed several more questions. But before we go to those, I want to report on the polling results from that first question, which asked, for those that work in school buildings and at school districts, what is your district or school doing to ensure that students learn fractions more completely? 14% of you said training teachers on using the number line to teach fractions. 15% said hiring and training mathematics specialists. 5% revising the district's curriculum in this area. 25% reviewing and potentially changing materials that have been used to teach fractions. A very small group, 2% moving the teaching of fractions to a different grade level. 4% said nothing at all since fractions are already well taught and well learned. 29%, the largest group, nothing at the moment. We've not fully digested that full math panel report. 
and 5% were doing something other than the above. Thanks, everyone, for responding. Be sure to finish the rest of those polling questions if you have not already. And now on to questions from our viewing audience. Like I said before, we got uh, lots in. And we're going to start with this one that came in from Fairmont, West Virginia. And Skip, I'm going to throw it to you first, um, and then open it up to Karen and Bertram. They asked, what are some good questions to get students to think beyond the rules of fractions? Well, first of all, that's a great question. And I think that I'm, I'm struck by uh, the taped response earlier is where, where I heard both uh, Denise and Patty use the phrase, where do fractions live? I like that. Uh, and it reminds me of doing some work with uh, fifth grade students not too many months ago, uh, working with placing and comparing fractions and related decimals and percent on a number line. And I, and I asked the question, where would nine-fifths go? And this student looked me square in the eye in a, in a very authoritarian tone and said, can't do it. And I said, what do, you, what do you mean you can't do it? And the answer was, because it's bigger than one. So where do fractions live? They live all over the place. And they certainly live beyond the points zero to one. So I don't think we can do enough of the kinds of activities that have children at the elementary level going in, on into middle school compare and look at relationships between fractions, decimals, and percent. But you, you do need to get to the operations. And the operations are very interesting in terms of how we think about them as we compare them to what students have done historically with whole numbers. For instance, you could argue, I think pretty successfully, that the addition and subtraction of fractions in particular are far, far more complex than the addition and subtraction of whole numbers. Mm -hmm. Think about, for instance, if you were to add 2 and 4 fifths and 3 and 1 third, you'd have to figure out a least common denominator. That implies that students have had some work with common multiples, least common multiple, how we use the least common multiple to help us def decide what the least common denominator is, get that all done. And by the way, I, you know, I uh, picked a number that you get an answer where uh, the fractions, once you do add them, is more than one, so you'd have to change that, and on and on. I mean, mm -hmm. tedious mm -hmm. work. On the other hand, if I say, what if we multiplied 3 fourths times 3 fourths? Well, kids know, we hope, at that point, that 3 times 3 is 9, and 4 times 4 is 16. I can just do tops times tops, bottoms times bottoms, and get 9 sixteenths, and I'm done, and not even realize that when we multiply fractions, 3 fourths times 3 fourths or whatever, we're essentially dividing. That, mm -hmm. that can be thought of as mm -hmm. 3 fourths of 3 fourths. It's, it's an answer of 9 sixteenths, which is smaller than what you started with. That's counter to what kids have learned to this point. Mm -hmm. And so, so lingering, if you will, over how these operations make sense. Oh, I, I have forgotten the big one. The big one is, of course, 3 fourths divided by 3 fourths. And you know the rule for that. Ours is not to wonder why, just invert and multiply. And we just flip that thing over magically. And we multiply that. And we get essentially, what, 12 twelfths or 1. If kids had a sense of number and somebody said to them, what's 3 fourths of 3 fourths? Hopefully, they would say, well, wait a minute. You just asked me what 3 fourths of 3, three fourths would be. It has to be 1. So I mean, that the amount of time we spend about thinking about how these numbers work, be they fractions, decimals, and percent, and kind of connecting those where appropriate, is, is so absolutely essential before we get to operations. Now, you could argue, and I often argue this, that the reason we move so quickly to operations is because they're on state-mandated mm -hmm. tests or other kinds mm -hmm. of national assessments. If you don't understand how those things work, you're flying blind. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I think if, and it's, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, sort of mystified that 29% of, of the viewing audience hasn't figured out what to do with fractions yet because they haven't understood or read the math, National Math Advisory Panel report. This is not, this is not new information. All, this, is, this has been around for a good long time. What we're trying to say is to provide some emphasis to this particularly critical foundation about these operations and, and, and how they work and how they build on the understanding of these things that we're, we're calling fractions but meet all of those applications mm -hmm. of those. So mm -hmm. I hope that starts at no, least a does, discussion. It does. 